Jesus, we start this year humbly and in prayer. We need you. We need you. And God, we start this year leaning into hard things because we know we can't do life the same way. We need you in a deeper way. So God, help us to live into your joy, even though it's the harder way. Help us to see the joy that comes. Lord, as we start here with prayer, as we start here focused on you, this is how we want to start this year. And Lord, come what may. May the storms come, but Lord, if our roots are deep in you, we will make it. So Lord, help us to dig deeper. Help us knowing that we can't change what other people are going to do, but we can live into life with you. And praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Grab your communion cup. And if you need one, just raise your hands. We can get one to you. Jesus is food for our souls. In John chapter 6, Jesus had a huge crowd of people following him, thousands upon thousands. And he taught some hard teaching. He said, my body is real food and my blood is real drink. And we understand what he meant by that now. They didn't understand that then. They didn't stick around long enough. And when they heard that, they left. So Jesus, in one sermon, went from over 5,000 down to 12. See how we pay attention to the numbers sometimes. But for Jesus, he taught what needed to be taught. And I hope if you're here and you're taking communion... You understand the nourishment we can get from Jesus. This is just a little bit of juice and a little wafer-like thingy, okay? But what we know is that this is a symbol that symbolizes the fact that Jesus himself, our creator, actually lives inside of us. No philosophy, entertainment, no religion teaches that except God. God is the one who teaches that I can come and live in you accept you when you're not perfect, forgive you. That's why we take this and we put it inside of us. So this is a feast for the people of God. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, the apostle Paul tells us, took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal was over, Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul goes on to say that as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. And he will come again. Okay? Okay. What a great way to start the year. Yeah? Almost feels like we should be done, but we're not going to. Sorry. And we're not going to. I know maybe you're thinking through that. Okay. Anything from the peanut gallery over here? We're okay? We're okay? Are we good? Okay. All right. You say amen if you need to. I'm ready. I love it. Okay. We're going to talk today about Agenda. We have an agenda. God has an agenda. Have you ever thought through that? God has an agenda for your life, right? He's not hidden about it. It's not a hidden agenda. He outright tells you, I have an agenda for your life. And here's the problem. You also have an agenda for your life. And your agenda, which you often don't think about, your agenda may collide with the agenda of God. Okay, you may have a, this is what my life is supposed to be like, this is how my time is supposed to be like, and that agenda may not line up to God. And here's the thing, our calendars, just like our budgets, they don't lie. And many of us lie to ourselves, we go, no, 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 this is absolutely the most important thing in my life, that's what I spend about one hour out of 168 on it. Okay, your calendar doesn't lie, time is a gift from God. Do you agree with that? Time is also a gift for God. You get it from God, you can give it back. When you're worshiping God, you have received air from God as a gift. Thank you, Jesus. And you're actually giving that air back to God in glory. Okay, That's how we live. And as you get deeper in your faith, you start to realize, I can be doing that all the time. 
Even when I talk to people, I can actually be giving those words back to help those people. That's a way to glorify and honor God. So you actually realize worship is supposed to be your whole life. Start to live that out, and it's powerful, okay? And we're going to be studying the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is one of the five major teaching sections in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first one. Jesus is making a very clear point by going up on a mountain and teaching God's word and God's way. He's showing himself to be the fulfillment of what Moses was doing. And any Jewish person back then would have known that, hey, this is what makes sense. And that's why Matthew actually puts five teaching sections together because there's five original kind of books of the Old Testament uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Jesus is fulfilling that role that Moses has. And in the Sermon on the Mount, it's an invitation from God, okay? And we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. We cannot cover everything in it. There's been super, like, crazy amounts of stuff on the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be focusing on how it relates to time, how it relates to our agenda, how it relates to our calendars. How many of you would say, you maybe need some work in terms of how you do your calendar, your rhythm, your life, your flow, your habits, stuff like that. I mean, you're like, yeah, that probably needs at least a once over, right? That's what we're trying to do this month. And, and today, your action steps are the same from the beginning. Obviously, the media fast, if you haven't done it and you want to start in on it, that's a challenge for today. The 10 test, something we start most years with, we'll talk about that. And then getting into a life group, and we'll also address the fact that people are like, I don't have time for that. Uh, but maybe if you're doing a media fast, your show isn't going to be on, so you just go for it, okay? So let's start in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. It says this, One day he saw the crowds gathering, and so Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down, and his disciples gathered around him and began to teach them, okay? So right there from the beginning, we're just going to stop there. Right there from the beginning, you notice that, first of all, crowds are drawn to Jesus, and his disciples came around him. I want you to understand this. If you have this picture of Jesus that's like, oh my gosh, you have to do this. Ugh. I know I'm supposed to. But you got the wrong picture of Jesus. Jesus, people were drawn to Jesus. People wanted to be around Jesus. People were like, teach me how you live because there's something about it that I really like. So if you have your mind in some picture, maybe it's because of church, maybe it's because of me, maybe it's because of your upbringing. If you have this picture of like you're supposed to, should, 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 then you got to sort of reprogram that and go, man, there's something about Jesus that's life. And Jesus' way is an invitation into life. So let me start with this. Jesus has an agenda for your life. And his first agenda for your life begins with rest. Is that the Jesus you know? Is that the first image when you think of Jesus? Rest. Come, follow me, and learn to rest, especially in our culture. We don't really know how to rest. I love that our culture gives two days off for most of us in our work. That's kind of seen as normal. You should have two days off. But somehow, most of us, you and I, we have two days and we take zero. We're filled up completely. We fill up every single minute. We can't even wait in line at a store without turning on our micro TVs. We are so distracted and we're so out of it and that leads to more anxiety and then the more anxious we are, the more we consume and the more we busy ourselves up because we've been taught from a young age, if you're busy, you can't get into trouble. And some of that's true, but I think we've taken it so far. Here's what Jesus says, and we read it earlier. Come to me, all of you who are weary. That count, anyone? Come to me, all you who are weary and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus' job description, check this out, compare it to yours. Jesus' job description was save the world. Is that pretty heavy? Pretty big? Yeah? Yeah, but he always never, he never seemed hurried. He was interruptible, he rested. So would you say his job was bigger than ours? So we can learn from his way of life, okay? You will find rest for your soul. In Mark 6, 31, Jesus called his disciples away, come with me, find a quiet place to rest. In Matthew 16, 13, and through 17, 13, uh, Jesus calls them away on a retreat, goes to Caesarea Philippi and asks them, who am I? He reveals himself to them and they figure it out and then he goes on a mountaintop and reveals himself even more called the transfiguration. 
It was in that time away that God revealed himself. Anyone found that pattern in life that when you take time away, God tends to reveal himself? That's why we take retreats. That's why we get away. That's why we do this frequently. That's why even your pastors frequently will do a half day retreat once a month because we need more and more of Jesus. And you can do that too. I've had people say to me, oh, that must be nice. And I say, it is, go do it, <laughs> right? It's an invitation. It's not guilt, it's an invitation. Go for it, right? Jesus is in the boat in Mark 4, 38. And there's a storm. And the disciples are freaking out in the storm. Know the feeling? What was Jesus doing? Anyone know? He was sleeping, right? Check this out. He rebuked the winds and the waves, but he didn't rebuke his disciples for being afraid. It's okay that you're afraid. But what he said to them is, why do you have so little faith? If I'm with you, don't you understand that's enough? Jesus was sleeping in the storm. It's okay if you're not. But he says, if I'm with you, you're going to be okay. The Sermon on the Mount smacks us in the face because it presents us a life where you don't have to worry so much. By the end of this sermon, he's saying, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the birds of the air. Why are you worried about what you're going to wear? About your money? And many of us go, I got a long answer to that question. I got some stories with money of how I've messed up. Okay, we'll get there. Okay? Can you rest? Honestly, can you personally rest? Do you know how to be still? For many of us, we don't know how to rest. We haven't ever learned how to rest. So like even when we rest, we're busy. In the Bible, the idea of Sabbath included that you did your chores the day before so that the day of you wouldn't have any to do. That was part of the Sabbath. It actually included, this is a big challenge, that you would cook all your meals in advance so that you could have one day a week, someone's going to say hallelujah, where you don't have to do any cooking. Okay? How do we live into these rhythms that God built in and then we ignore them and then we come to him and say, God, what's wrong? It's not working. And God's trying to say, try my way. See if it works. We try the halfway version of God and then go, but it doesn't really work. It doesn't. Try the I'm going to go for it way and see what happens. And it starts with rest. Do you know how to rest in him? So that's why we're doing a media fast, right? We've already covered the areas of it. And that could be, uh, you know, that could be, you know, screen time in terms of shows and movies and sports. You could say, no, I'm not going to do that thing, okay? So like for me, I'm still going to watch the playoffs, okay? I'm sorry, I'm still going to do that. But I'm not going to watch all the sports centers and all the other stuff. Like that. You're going to find that version for you, okay? You know, it could be no music. We talked about no video games, any form of those. And maybe you're saying, I can't. I know I'm addicted. I just have to do it, okay? So you're going to have to find that. It's not legalism. People have come up and said, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that, okay? And I'm like, that's fine. It's not a command. It's an invitation. Can you see it as an invitation? Can you know where you are? My job is to care for you and to challenge you for what I see God doing. And your job is to take that and then to apply it to your life in the way that you think makes the most sense. This is not legalism. This isn't like, oh my gosh, you're listening to music. I can't be with you anymore. Okay, it's not like that. Okay, this is a you finding that version. And here's how I love, there have been people who come up to me and said, I actually started this in December. And I said, why did you do that? And they're like, because I can't just start in January. I got to start now. I got to wean myself off of the media. And I got to get this in my life. I've had people say, I had someone come up to me and say, I'm actually going to give up books. And I was like, wait, why is that? And they're like, because you're talking about being distracted from life. That's what I use novels to do. And I actually need to do that. For you, I didn't listen on here, but for you, you might be addicted to podcasts, right? You might be addicted to the news, Okay, you may need to take a break from that or only do it once a week or some version of that, okay? You gotta find out your thing. And I've said to people, hey, and they're like, I cannot not do music. And I'm like, well, try it for a week. Is the fact that you can't do it reveal anything about where you're at? Okay, try it for one week. And I look back at my life and go, I don't know that I've had a week in my whole life where I haven't had music. I had music from like the time I was an infant. We've always had music there, and I just think, what would it be like to process silence rather than sometimes you know how music tells you what to feel, right? So how would I do just with that?
okay? And I've had people come up and say, I'm excited for this. I've had people come up and say, I hate this, and I hate you. Not really. But uh, we have people doing all this stuff. I have people saying, again, a per- person who's giving out novels. Uh, I've, I've had married couples say, man, we're going to do more talking together and other married things. So there could be all these benefits to this time. And we have uh, some journals for you. Uh, I didn't get a ton of them. We got about uh, 25, and then we have 25 in the next service. But they look like this. They got a little Covenant Grove embossing on there. And if you're a journaling type of person, you're saying, hey, I want to do some more of this. I want to be able to have some thread down. You can go ahead and grab one of those. There's no cost to them. They're right here. You can get that after the service. And um, I am excited about this time together. I'm excited to see what it does for our church. Let's get back into God's word, Matthew 5, verse 3 says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you're my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Okay? So, We're going to start here and say Jesus' agenda not only begins with rest, his priority is the people we become. The people we become. I think for a lot of us, the most important thing is what we do. And we often evaluate other people about who are, what what do you do? And, And even when we pray to God, it's often like, God, here's what I need you to do. But when you actually get into a relationship with God, you start to realize what I love most about God is who he is. Now that includes what he does, but you start to actually praise him for his character and you start to realize he's changing your character. God's mission, God's agenda priority is the person you become. Notice that when you're looking at these verses, it doesn't say God blesses when you do mercy or when you do justice. It's blessed are the peacemakers are the merciful, are the meek. It's, it's who you are. Can you imagine not just doing some peacemaking things, but being a person of peace? That around you is humility. Around you is poverty of spirit, not arrogance or pride or hubris. Can you imagine that's the person you are? Okay? It starts in that rest. It starts in that. Okay? Now, couple things about this people have looked at these for years and goes this is not normal for human beings to be these things and my answer back to you is no it's not no it's not this is not a list of any culture anywhere in the world that says this is what we want of our citizens poor in spirit humble meek peacemakers and they get persecuted for doing what's right yeah we want people like that right this is not on the seven habits of highly successful people right This is the way of Jesus. And is it strange that even cultures that say, hey, we're a Christian culture, aren't trying to embrace these values? These aren't normal. We would probably go so far as to say, I don't think they actually make a good world, Jesus. I think my agenda is better than yours. Have we ever tried this way? Have you realized, now if you look at this list, and look at your life, including the hardships. Can you, can you start to understand that this is the type of person God's trying to make you? Right? If he's going to make you a peacemaker, he's going to put you where? Where there's no peace. If he's going to make you meek and humble, he's going to put you in places where you're tempted to be arrogant and vain and make it about you and buy more than you need. Right? If he's going to say you need to strive for justice in the earth, He's going to put you in situations that are unjust. And yet we cry out to God going, why is there injustice? And God's going, I'm trying to change you. You want me just to fix the problem. Hey, my friends, I need to say something that's really hard. We are the problem. We want God to fix something. He's trying to fix us as people. 
We say if God was so loving, there wouldn't be problems. And God is so loving that he's so relational. He's not just going to fix some abstract problem. He's going to change us. And it has to happen year after year because you and I keep relapsing back into what we've done. And then it has to happen generation after generation because even if you and I get it, how, does it, how do we make sure it goes on to the next generation? It's not just a formula. It's not just, yep, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's it, I'm done. This is a transformation change. And if God's trying to change your character, I hope you can understand it's a lot more than, hey, I can just follow this formula or show up even just to church or just check my box because God's actually trying to change who you are, the person you are. And of course, your actions matter. Your actions come from your character and your actions shape your character. It goes in both directions. Your character matters. Your actions matter. Your intentions matter. And all of this connects to time. Because you're choosing every day what to do with your time. Part of the reason this sermon series and this Sermon on the Mount and our media fast go together is I wanted us to get jolted out of how much time we spend on our screens. And I want us to get jolted into God has is inviting you into. If you're at five hours a day, which was the old normal, seven hours a day is the new normal, God's inviting you into 30 to 50 hours of time per week given back to you. There's a gift. What would you do with it? I think that's what we're gonna go through, okay? God shapes you by you spending time with him and also you spending time with others. The Bible is very, 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 very clear about this, that God shapes us in both directions when we have relationships in both directions, and you can't have one without the other. And sometimes you're like, well, I go to church, and I'm in a group, and I do all these things, and I connect with people. I don't really know if I know Jesus. I can't really pray very much, and I can't, have, I can't sit alone. I'm kind of like spiritually ADD, but you know, that's okay, because I do all the church things, and God says, no, you need to actually come away with me and be still with me and have those times with me and learn those rhythms. And then there's other people who are the ivory tower people, like, who cares about people? I love Jesus. And Jesus is like, but I'm there with the people. If you love me, follow me and go do life with me. And that's the part that's hard because you're like, yeah, but people suck, right? And God's like, I know, and I've accepted you and I've forgiven you and you have not accepted forgiveness until you learn to forgive. The Bible goes so far as to say receiving forgiveness has to change your character so that you learn to forgive others. That's why Jesus would say, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And you're like, how does that work? It sounds like an if then, but it's not. It's a character transformation. God changes our character in relationship with himself and with others. So that's why in our church we talk so much about life groups. That's why we want everyone in them. And I want to say this to you. Our life groups are not therapy groups. They're not primarily for, hey, I need to just pour out all my problems to you. And there's been times where I've heard that our life groups are like, hey, we spend 45 minutes sharing our problems, three minutes praying, and man, isn't God good? And I'm like, no, it's, this is not a therapy group. This is for discipleship. Because I gotta tell you, if you get closer to Jesus, 90% of your problems are gonna go away because 90% of your problems are you, your attitude, your reaction, the way you do things, the way you respond to people. And that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. He absolutely loves you. But even the way we do time in our life groups matters. We need to be studying the word and sharing not only what did it mean in its original context, but what does it mean for you and what are you going to do with it right now? Okay? God is setting a feast of his word in front of us. And many of us sit there and talk about what it looks like. Man, look how great it is. Look what God did. I love when he adds cheese. It's so great. Cheese is my favorite. Okay? That's how we do our Bible study sometimes. If God puts some food in front of you, what do you think he wants you to do? Eat it. That's not just talking about it. What are you gonna do with it? Go and do something. If God put a tool in front of you, what do you think he wants you to do? Build something, right? God puts these things in his word and we go, man, I love that tool. My favorite one, battery lasts forever. Best brand. Well, what are you doing with it? Oh, I don't know. In our life groups, we need to be studying the Bible and then sharing with somebody else, this is what I'm planning on doing. You know why we don't share what we're planning on doing with it in front of other people? Because we know we probably ain't going to do it. 
because we don't have enough time to live out what we're reading in scripture because we're just trying to squeeze it in, right? But what if we actually said, God, I'm gonna give you the time. I have enough time to read your word and I have enough time to live your word and see what happens, okay? This isn't guilt, it's an invitation. But it changes how we do things and it changes how we do time. And I say, if you're not on a team and you're here, get onto a team. We got plenty of need for setup. We're doing tons of setup now. Come and set up with us. We start at 7 a.m., okay? You don't have to come every week. Come week you can. We can usher, you can greet, you can do stuff like that, okay? It's a blessing, okay? Get onto a life group. My hope is that every single person watching, we have online groups, every single person here will get into a group, okay? It makes a huge difference, and I want to encourage you, sign up. All you have to do is put on your Connect card. Boop, 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 boop. Get me into a life group. Okay, we got tons of different groups. And I know you got tons of different reasons why, like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't like that. Hey, I've had a hard time with life groups myself, okay? Small groups early on in my career when I was very, very young, okay? There was a small group in the church that thought it was their job to say all the things I was doing wrong in my job, and they were trying to get me fired. I didn't have a great feeling about small groups for a long time, okay? Then I was in a small group of people who did the therapy thing, and we didn't really study the Bible, and I'm thinking, why am I here, Right? But you know what? As we've done life groups over these last few years, especially even early on in the church plant, I'm starting to talk to people and it's like, hey, I'm struggling with some lust. And now we're praying for each other and we're supporting each other and holding each other accountable. Now we're talking about marriage struggles and we're lifting each other up. Now someone is struggling to pay their rent and the life group comes around them and supports them or helps them move or does the thing that needs to happen. And suddenly I start to understand not just mentally, but experientially, the importance of life together. The importance of a group of people, doesn't even have to be your friends, okay, but people you do life together and they support you and they're part of your support system. How important that is and how much we need that, okay? Everyone who does these things makes a huge difference, okay? So don't neglect those things, live into that, okay? Let's keep going. Matthew 5, 13 through 15. These are our last verses here for today. It says this, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a blanket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Okay? We're made to make a difference. We're made to be light to the world. And I want you to almost, I'm almost use a different analogy, right? Like if you want to have water to give to others, living water that Jesus says, the water of life, you aren't living water. I am not living water. We have to get that filled up from somewhere. We get that filled up from Jesus, right? And if you have that time with Jesus in the word, in with people on your own, okay, then you can actually pour out the light of life to other people, the water of life to other people. But if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to give it. Now, here's the thing. Many of us are trying our best to follow Jesus without Jesus. We're trying to follow the teachings of Jesus without Jesus, right? But if you get filled up with his life, then you have overflow to pour out to other people, okay? Jesus says you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. But he also says in John 8 that he's the light of the world. You know how that works, right? He's the light of the world, and he's living inside of you so that you can be the light of the world. We are supposed to reflect his light. You don't create your own light. It's not about you. It's about him, okay? And this is a huge thing for how we spend our time. And it makes a huge difference. Now, I said earlier, your calendar doesn't lie. So what I'm going to say on this is, your calendar reveals where you think the real water of life is in this world. That's not me. Okay, that's, that's all I know, okay? Someone's pulling out their keys. Hey, someone got it. Amen, hallelujah. I love when churches like this. It's fun. Keeps it keeps it fresh, all right? Okay? Your calendar reveals where you believe the water of life is. 
If you are saying, I'm spending all of this time on games, all of this time with this person, all of this time with family, all this time on work, all this time on exercise, all this time on diet, what you're saying is, this is where I believe life is found. All those things I just listed are good. Even the video games. They're all good. But you got to ask that question, is that my source of life? The problem is for many Christians, we just try to sprinkle a little Jesus sauce on top of our lives. Live our lives the way we want, live our own agenda, and just slap the Jesus bumper sticker on and say, I'm good. I got Jesus. What's the minimum amount I need to do to get into heaven is what we ask. And we're trying to do the least amount to get into heaven. God's not trying to just get us into heaven. He's trying to get heaven into us. He's trying to change your character. And character work is hard. It takes time. It takes work. Okay? That's what God's all about. Okay? So what we're talking about here is training is stronger than trying. Training is stronger than trying. How many of you have had a thing you're like, I really, really want to do this. I really, really want to do this. And then you don't do it. That doesn't mean you didn't want to. It means that training is stronger than trying. I had a friend who wanted to run a marathon so badly, three years in a row, he signed up and paid for a marathon, but he didn't do the training. And so the marathon time came, and the first year he got like five miles in, and then the second year he's like, yeah, I need to work a little bit better ahead of time. So he's like, I'm going to try and run a little bit beforehand. So he'd run like one or two miles, like three or four times a week. Didn't work. Okay. That year he got about 10 miles in before he couldn't make it. The furthest he ever got was 15 miles, and they couldn't do it. And then finally, he knew what he needed to do. He's like, I need to train. So he got, got an app. He like, got people he could run with because they would encourage him because most of us know we can't do it alone. right? And so he got that, that help. He got that support. He started running. He started getting in shape. He ran that marathon, and he finished. And I said to him, hey, you know the difference, right? And he said, yeah, of course. I, I always knew what I needed to do. It was just putting the time in. And I said, man, I'm so proud of you. And he said, when are you going to do this with me? <laughs> I still have not run a marathon. So uh, it's a big commitment, right? You got to, training is stronger than trying. And I think so many of us were like, but I have a heart for God. And my answer back is, do you have habits for God too? We have heart, but do you have habits? The habits are stronger than just, why well, I feel this. I have a heart. I have a desire for it. It doesn't work. I mean, what if you really, really, really want your work to be done? We still got to do it. If you really, really, really want to have a better marriage, I really want to. But you have the habits to do it. Training is stronger than trying. Okay? And as we do this, I'm just going to say, we do this thing every year called the 10 test. We do it in January, okay? These are biblical things, and it's 10% of your income, 10 minutes a day. We've already talked about that one. One day of work for, one day a week for worship and rest. And maybe you're saying, hey, I work sometimes once a month or every other week on these Sundays. And I would say to you, still give one day a week for, for worship and rest. Maybe that's going to be on a Monday. You watch the live stream. Okay, or maybe you're going to watch a different live stream because you're like, man, Scott, you're okay, but there's other people way better, okay? So you do whatever you need to do, and you set that aside for worship and rest and actually try it. Try it out. God actually says for us to do this. In the Old Testament, he says, I created the earth in six days, so rest. And then he also says in Deuteronomy, he says, you were slaves, You've been set free from slavery, so don't work every single day of the week. And you know what our answer back to God is? I like the slavery thing. I want to work seven days a week. I don't think your way is the best way. I don't think I really need a day off. I don't want a day off. I'm not going to do it, God. I'm feeling anxious. God, what's wrong? God, what's happening in my life? Why do I feel like I have no margin? Why do I feel overloaded? God changes those things and changes those rhythms. Why is it called a test? Uh, it's really small on stream, but it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this. Only time in the Bible, God says we can test him. That if we give him the tithe, percent, that God's going to bless that. Now, here's the thing. In the New Testament, we are not commanded to give God 10%. I want to make sure you understand that because we're Christians. What we're commanded to do in the New Testament is to give sacrificially. For many of us, that's going to be more than 10%. 
For some of us, it's going to be less than 10%. The Bible says each one of us decides. But you need to say, am I giving sacrificially the way Jesus gave to me? And God challenges you in that and grows you in that and blesses you in that. And this is the 10 test. So what I'm asking you to do, we in the past have done cards. Uh, we're not doing cards this year. But what I want you to do is on your Connect card, and if you've already filled it out, do it again. And if you're saying, hey, I can do this one, then, do, then just put, I'll do 10%. Or if I'm saying I'll do 10% and 10 minutes, you can do one, you can do two, you can do three, you can do any combination. But if you could put down on there what you're doing, it actually is kind of a fun follow-up thing where we give you some encouragement saying, hey, thank you for doing that. God bless you. Good luck. Sometimes it's hard. And what we've said in our church for many, many years is if you test God in this 10%, if this is a new thing for you, you say, God, I'm going to give you 10%. If you want to do that for a couple of months, and if you don't feel like God has blessed your life financially and in other areas of life because of that, we'll give you the money back. Because if God says we can put him to the test, the church should be able to put their money, his money, where that is too. Okay? So you can do that as well. Okay? I can't quite promise you that on like your 10 minutes a day. I can't give you 10 minutes back, you know, like... <laughs> I can't do that one, but I can do the other ones, okay? So on your Connect card, if you can fill that out, that would be a huge blessing, okay? And, and to do that. So, time. God has an agenda. Can it make a difference? Here's what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. It's been found difficult and left untried, okay? Early on in youth ministry, uh, there were kids, I was trying to get them to believe in God and grow and do faith and do life and have all that stuff, and they weren't getting it, And because part of it is they had been in church their whole lives, and, and I've done the church thing, I show up, and, I, and that's it, and I'm like, no, there's, there's more, there's more than just the showing up, you got to put it into action, and they didn't get it, and then finally, there was this kid named Kyle, and he came into the group. And he gave his life to Jesus, and then he was growing, and then he was in leadership, and then he was on the worship team. And, and, and this is like a year later, and some of those students would go up to Kyle like, what is it? You've only been in this church for like 18 months. I've been in this church my whole life. Why do you have this fire for Jesus that I don't have? And Kyle would say, I, I don't know. Are you actually doing it? Are you actually doing it? And their answer was, maybe not. you got to get to that spot where you say, God, I want your agenda for my life more than mine. And Lord, I surrender my calendar to you. That's how we're going to start this year. That's what we're going to be talking about this month. I hope I haven't scared you off for future weeks. Let's pray as we wrap up this first week. God, thank you so much for who you are and for all that you've done. Jesus, we love you. And God, there's so much that's on our agendas. Even today, God, there's things that we got to get done. But help us to let this day be a day of rest. A day that we worship you and connect with those that we love, connect with your family. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. We give you our time just as you have given us your time. In Jesus' name, amen.